After 2015, we started seeing sea ice dropping in the Antarctic, and the last seven or eight years has basically been much lower than the pre preceding years. And this is the context that we're seeing 2023's record in. 2023 is astoundingly low, even in the context of those eight years of very low uh, sea ice extents. Hello, and welcome to this first episode of Beyond the Ice, a new podcast from the British Antarctic Survey, where we get you up to speed with newsworthy science and engineering from the polar regions. My name is M. Newton, and today I want to find out more about sea ice and the record-breaking lows that we saw in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica in 2023. Why did millions of square kilometres of sea ice fail to form, and why does it matter? I'm really pleased to be joined today by Dr. Ella Gilbert, who is a climate scientist at British Antarctic Survey. She specialises in modelling how the Antarctic and Arctic climates might change and particularly how atmospheric processes and weather play a part in that. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. OK, so for anyone coming to this really cold, what is sea ice? So <laughs> sea ice is kind of what it says on the tin. So it's basically this floating layer of ice that forms at the surface of the ocean, hence sea and ice. So it's a frozen layer that sits around the Antarctic continent or in the Arctic Ocean. Cool. And that's a different thing, say, to icebergs. It is exactly a different thing, but it's one of only, I don't know, you could probably say six types. So how much of the ocean is covered by sea ice, would you say? Oh, well, this depends very much on which pole we're talking about and which season we're talking about. So the Arctic is basically an ocean covered with frozen ice. So it has lots of sea ice year round, but that shrinks to a very small amount in the summer and then grows again in the winter. Same sort of deal in the Antarctic, except the Antarctic is, of course, a f continent surrounded by ocean. So the, the amount of sea ice in Antarctica increases by six times between the summer when it's at its minimum and its maximum in winter. And it actually doubles the size of the Antarctic continent by area as it gets from minimum to maximum. So it waxes and wanes throughout the year. So when we have the winter, when it's obviously much colder, we have much more sea ice. And that in the Antarctic reaches up to about 17 or 18 million square kilometres, which is bigger than Russia the yeah. largest country in the world. It's, bigger so it's, than, it's big. Yeah. It's a lot of area. <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of shrinks very much to around about 3 million square kilometres in the summer. So that's a really Usually. dramatic change, actually. Really isn't it? dramatic, yeah. Just as part cold. of the natural processes of the planet. So we have in a normal year this kind of high point and low point of the area of sea ice. Why is that important? What does it do for the planet? Well, sea ice is a really vital piece of the puzzle when it comes to our climate system. So on the surface, it's, it acts as a very bright, white, reflective surface. So it's kind of like a mirror and it reflects lots of the sun's energy back to space, which essentially keeps Antarctica cool, but also keeps the rest of the planet cool. And this exactly the same process is happening in the Arctic as well. So sea ice forms a very crucial kind of regulator uh, in our in our climate system, it keeps the temperature fairly stable. Um, it also has very important consequences for ocean currents, so the way that uh, water moves around the planet. Um, it can act as a sort of buffer layer to protect the ice on the Antarctic continent from being smashed apart by smashy smashy wave action, basically, <laughs> uh, which is obviously good because we want to keep as much of that land ice on land as possible if we want to avoid uh, sea level rise. Um, but it also acts as a habitat um, for lots of very charismatic uh, mammals around the Antarctic like penguins or seals and all the little very important microorganisms that live in and around the ice. So it's really playing both a physical role and a kind of biological ecological role as well. It's doing exactly. Oh. Okay so fast forward to last summer, June 2023, August 2023 and there's much less sea ice than usual. Was that a big surprise? Is that a sudden thing? So I'd actually say that this even starts earlier than this. So okay. in Antarctic summer, which is February 2023, we had a record minimum extent. So this, um, it was the second time that it dropped below 2 million square kilometres. The previous record was set in 2022, so it didn't hold on to the record for very long. Uh, 2023 then broke through that. I think we got to 1.78 million square kilometres or something like this, but it was a record. And then throughout the kind of winter or autumn freeze-up period, 
the ice began to freeze fairly slowly. And that meant that by July, we had an area of sea ice that was missing that was equivalent to the, the world's 10th largest country. So it was about two and a half million square kilometers of sea ice that was missing in comparison to what we would expect for the time of year. And in fact, for the whole of that winter season from June to August, we saw a pretty mind-boggling deficit in comparison to what we would expect from the previous year's kind of average. That's a huge difference, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the average maximum is between 17, 18, something like that. And to have two and a half million square kilometres missing is, yeah, it's a big chunk. OK, so is this unique to 2023 or actually is this a trend that we've been seeing for a long time? 2023 is pretty unprecedented. It's pretty remarkable in the context of the records that we have. Um, until about 2015, there was a quite puzzling trend in that in sea ice, it was slightly increasing over the period that we have observations from, from 1979 to about 2014, 2015. And there were lots of different theories about why that was but generally it was slightly increasing and this is you know it's kind of the opposite of what you might expect in the context of human driven climate change um, and then after 2015 we started seeing sea ice dropping in the Antarctic and the last seven or eight years has basically been much lower than the pre preceding years and this is the context that we're seeing 2023's record in 2023 is astoundingly low, even in the context of those eight years of very low uh, sea ice extents. But before, up until 2015, we were seeing a slight increase. That's so interesting. So it was actually doing the opposite. So do we know what happened in 2015? Or is that going to be a, a mystery that will slowly get unraveled by science? Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of uh, discussion about this still. People were still, re we, we, we haven't settled on an answer for why it was slightly increasing until 2015 either. That's still up for debate there's lots of different theories you know there are the antarctic is a very complicated system because it's huge there's lots of different factors playing a role in different parts and different sectors of the antarctic or the ocean surrounding antarctica so some scientists have linked it to these big big weather patterns for example the southern annular mode which controls how strong the winds are around antarctica also to el nino which people may be familiar with from the increasing temperatures that have been associated with el nino in 2023 um, and also there's more regional kind of atmospheric weather patterns that are playing a role there's also some suggestions that it was related to the ozone hole to greenhouse gas forcing and it could be uh, there's a big role for natural kind of ups and downs, the natural variability in the sea ice. So, yeah, the jury's still out on exactly why that was. And similarly, I would say that the drop is still up for discussion. Um, there's probably um, a role for human-caused climate change. This is something that's like emerging as a, as a leading argument. Um, some scientists have called this a regime shift. Um, and climate models for a very long time have predicted a decline in the Antarctic like we see in the Arctic. Um, until 2015, of course, the observations did not agree. So there's obviously something not quite right there, but we expect over the much longer term out to, you know, 2100, et cetera, that sea ice will start to decline. So it could be some role for lots of different things. Right. So there's this mixture of natural factors which cause the variability and then the potential role of human induced climate change. So in terms of the natural factors, I think one that gets kind of brought up a lot in the media is El Nino. Could you say a little bit about what that what that actually is for the layperson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so El Nino is a natural pattern. It's basically a, about the temperature of the surface ocean in the tropical Pacific. So you might think, what has the tropical Pacific got to do with Antarctic sea ice? But it basically has a strong influence on all parts of the globe because we have connections via a whole bunch of very complicated atmospheric connections, oceanic connections to the whole planet. And this can have a role in, in for example, in Europe, it tends to raise our temperatures. So we've seen globally um, much warmer temperatures in 2023 because there was a very strong El Nino and it its flip side is called La Nina, and that tends to re result in co uh, cooler temperatures. So it can have uh, an impact on global temperatures, but it can also influence weather patterns and it can also influence things like sea ice. Interesting. OK, so we're looking at this, as you've kind of touched on, we're looking at this variation in sea ice against, I think, 45 years of satellite data. 
that's a long time to, to you or me, but it's pretty short in terms of climate history. In terms of the big deficit in ice that we saw in 2023, is it possible for us to say how significant that difference is? Um, could that still just be natural variation or is that pointing to something else? So this is a really important question that we really do need to get a handle on. Um, natural variability is, of course, causing sea ice to go up and to go down. And the system, the Antarctic sea ice system is very variable. It goes up and it goes down quite a lot. And this is something that was around in the media quite a lot, this, this idea of exactly how rare are 2023 conditions in comparison to the long-term trend. The problem is that we don't have a long-term a set of observations. 45 years, as you say, in climate history is very, very short, um, but we've got to work with what we've got. Um, there were lots of suggestions of this kind of black swan event type um, probability. It was a one in a seven and a half million year event or something like this. Um, the problem with that is that it assumes quite a lot of things about Antarctic sea ice. Number one, that it, there's no trend, which I think we can see that there is. Um, and then also that these 45 years kind of are reflective of what sea ice has been doing forever, which again is not necessarily a valid assumption. So I think what we can say conclusively is that this is a remarkable event, that Antarctic sea ice conditions in 2023 were unprecedented and they were very unusual, but it's very difficult to associate a number of exactly how rare that was because of these assumptions that underlie those sort of probabilistic estimates. And I guess it fits in with this wider picture because 2023 was a record-breaking year in, in lots of ways. Um, the National Centres for Environmental Information said it was the warmest year on record. Um, in July 2023, the World Meteorological Organization said that the average sea surface temperatures have reached a record high. So could it just be as simple as saying that a warmer world means less sea ice? I mean, on the top level, yes, a warmer world means more melting, less ice. But it's a bit more complicated than that because a warmer world also comes with more extremes. It also comes with changes to the way it air and oceans move around the planet. In a warm atmosphere, we have more precipitation that can influence things like um, ice formation. Um, and there's so many factors at play that it, it is quite difficult to pull out a kind of coherent, one nice, simple answer. OK, so zooming out, why does sea ice matter? In terms of the long term decline of sea ice, what effect can we expect that might have on our global systems? Pretty simply, um, what is happening in the Arctic, where we have much less sea ice than we used to have, it exposes a dark ocean beneath, it absorbs more energy, it kind of accelerates warming and sea ice loss in this like reinforcing cycle. This is something that's related to what we call polar amplification. And it basically means that the Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet. And that has consequences not just for the Arctic, it has consequences for the whole planet. And that process of polar amplification we're starting to see emerging in the Antarctic and this is what we're worried about because this is something that will again it will add you know when we've got two poles being warming faster than than average then that will accelerate the amount of warming and of course we know that warming has disastrous consequences for all of us all over the world whether it's about extreme temperatures or extreme flooding droughts uh, sea level rise all of these problems will be exacerbated and accelerated by the loss of sea ice because it has global consequences that do not just stay in the Antarctic. As we say at Bass, what happens in Antarctica doesn't stay in Antarctica. Exactly. Fab, thank you so much for all your expertise on that. If you want to dig into the sea ice story in more detail, Ella has written a long explainer for Beyond the Ice, which you can find on the British Antarctic Survey website or on our Beyond the Ice LinkedIn newsletter. Ella is also a prolific science communicator in the media and on socials. Ella, where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find me on pretty much all platforms at Dr. Gilbs, mostly with an underscore at the in the middle and a Z at the end. Yeah, I've made about three videos on it, and which are on my YouTube channel, which are also Dr. Gilbs. Thanks, Ella. Pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this first episode of Beyond the Ice from the British Antarctic Survey. If you'd like to come back for the next episode, do subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast app. If you really enjoyed the podcast, do consider leaving a rating or review or recommending the podcast to friends and family. Next month, we'll be talking to Dr. Louise Simon and Dr. Thomas Brace Girdle about tipping points and their relationship to extreme events in Antarctica and beyond. 